let me try this again. Let me see uh, if I can invite my husband on here. Now then. Okay. Hey there. Hey. hey. I mean, I don't hear it. Yeah, it's, yeah happening it's happening again. again. You hear an echo? Uh huh. I don't hear the echo. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come X him out. It's terrible when you have to cut your husband off. <laughs> Hang on, guys. So, yeah, I, thanks, Rose. So, there was feedback. I don't know. We're in the same house, but we thought it would be better to have more of an interview um, setting. So, he is right here. You want to come on over, honey? Yeah, I think I'll even get a chair. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. See, what I laugh at is um, this is a message that I don't know that uh, wait are you guys still hearing it probably they couldn't be hearing it now there wouldn't be feedback now right no i turned off my phone yeah so if you guys are still hearing feedback then tell us but i can't imagine i can't imagine i think you either uh... i always feel like i have a giant head when we come on together <laughs> well that's because you do your hair and i have no <laughs> hair Word. Okay, we're all good now. Thank you, Suzanne. I keep thinking that I was sitting on a phone book. Or you, you can lower your chair. There we go. <laughs> is that better? Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this is why we um, we're gonna do separate rooms because of this banter. This is not helpful. Now then, mm. maybe you should just look at me. But yeah, turn the chair. Come on. Do the things. <laughs> okay. Because I wanted to interview my husband. No, no, like um, all right, if you were watching last night, our, my, the video, the class that I taught on, um, healing from mental illness, like I shared Mark's story a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then today you did an Instagram live. Yeah. With Maribel. With Maribel O'Brien, one of our really good friends. And here's me. If you guys know me, my friends and my mom's watching, if you know me, I get an idea. I'm like, we have to do this right now. The challenge was, is they were on a live and I was running and I couldn't run home fast enough so I could get cleaned up so we could get on here because you guys have to hear his story. His story is amazing. And I was listening to them. I'm like, oh my gosh, I had forgotten. I forgot about the psych ward. I forgot, well, not that I didn't, I forgotten that it was so dramatic. I forgot that he had hallucinations and all these things. So I'm just going to ask you questions. Okay. Am I visible? Uh, you're there. Kind of. There we are. Okay. Scoochie. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, you can talk to them too, but, um, can you share just about like Korea? Cause you, I shared with them last night that, um, you started feeling low, like mm -hmm. in your late teens. Yeah. But I think what was so powerful to me is when you were talking about Korea, like, I feel like that is just the catalyst of the quite literal crazy train. That was crazy. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the question that Maribel asked me this morning was, do you recall the time when like just a regular stress cross over into like anxiety? Oh, interesting. Okay. And I do remember I missed that. that. Okay. Um, because I, and what I told her is that I did, I know like in my late teens, early twenties, I did start to have, I, I, I had plenty of emotional struggles. Um, and I joined the army when I was 23. Mm -hmm. And then I was in Germany for a couple of years. And when I was in Germany, I got, uh, I actually managed to get overweight again. Um, and also was taking a lot of illegal stuff. Because it's so prolific there. It's so prevalent and so easy and all that. So when I got to Korea, like a, it was like a perfect storm. 
Mm. Because I had to, I, instead of being with a very relaxed unit in Germany, I was now stationed with an infantry battalion close to the DMZ. Yeah. So uh, they did not tolerate the weight. They're like, okay. No. <laughs> so wait, I just want to, just to timeline. So you were joined, so you were really overweight mm. when you joined the army. Yeah. But then they, because uh, the army doesn't tolerate being fat. They just don't. Yeah. It's not a thing. So they, um, you lost a ton of weight. I remember you telling, like, we always joke with the kid. We tell the kids about when dad, they would give, they load marks plate up, right, with food and basic. And then they give it to the really skinny guy. And yeah, we yeah, just, yeah. it's just like a funny story that we share. It's funny, not funny. So you, you lost a bunch of weight, but then you went to Germany after that. Yeah, I went to Germany after that. And it was, a, uh, it was just a, uh... It's my bulldog. It's, it's a bulldog. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a, it was a very relaxing. It was part of the NATO group, so we took like French holidays, Italian holidays. Germany. Yeah, we took all the super holidays. chill. Yeah. So you then, gained all your weight back there. Done a bunch of drugs. Drinking is right. if you've never been to Germany, there's nothing. Well, there's a lot to do, and you drink a lot of beer. Right. And I broke my hand. I broke my arm, which kept me in cast, so I wasn't working out as much. So boom. There you go, Chevy. So. so then you go to Korea, which I don't think, if you are not in the military, I don't think people really grasp how stressful it that is. would be. It is. Like when you first, when you first, it was the time, when you first arrive in country, they line you up against a wall that has a six foot mark on it. And anybody that's over the line goes to the DMZ. Anybody that's under the line go somewhere else. Why? Because they, they want all the tall people up to DMZ for propaganda. They want the North Koreans to look across and only see big guys. Interesting. So me at, right at six foot, I got to be a couple miles away from the DMZ. Um, so you weren't quite six foot. Right. Yes. So <laughs> I was in that now. So I was in the, I was in Camp Casey and it is stressful. They, and there's a lot of rules about, um, we had to shred all our paper before it went in the garbage, even if it was a laundry receipt, because North Koreans could steal your laundry receipt and start to get ideas of like how much, okay, well, this much clothing represents this much personnel. Sure. Um, all that type of stuff. And there was frequently, like sometimes we could go off base, sometimes we couldn't. Yeah. It would be like literally walled in with razor wire and you cannot leave because of terrorist threats. Sure. Uh, things like that. And, and they remind you, we live in range of communist artillery. Which, for somebody who deals with stress and anxiety and depression already, mm -hmm. that can make you right. a little crazy. And then I had, um, I had a particular, I had a sergeant who was a former drill sergeant um, assigned to me specifically to help me lose weight. How nice. Yes. <laughs> So I was working out six days a week instead of five. So it was like it was like two, uh, I was doing two a days and all that. Um, oh, Billy wants to say hello. No, <laughs> look at them voters. <laughs> so anyway, I think losing, re losing a bunch of weight after being doing a bunch of drugs just like detoxed me and let all kinds of stuff into my system. Sure. But that didn't help. And the way you lose weight, because you know now, having lost 75 pounds and kept it off seven years, mm -hmm. you know there's a healthy way to do it, and you did it quick, so it's not about the time, it's just the what you're putting in your body and the mindset that you have behind losing all the weight. Right, and for me, I was panicked about being overweight, so I didn't eat, sure. much. I didn't eat much. Right. And I was running a lot, but then at night I would drink. So not a good combo. So what I love that you share with Maribel, um, <clears throat> well, not loved it, but I just thought it was so impactful was the time you were walking down the road with Cannon. Yeah. Who our, who our Cannon is named after. Right. Um, and when you're standing in formation, I was like, dang, that is powerful. So if you could yeah. tell them that. Yeah, I was walking down the, it, it was just, yeah, it was just a bundle um, <clears throat> of stress. And I was walking down just down the road on the base with my buddy Cannon and I do this as so I'm walking down, we're walking down the road. He looks at me and goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I... saluting LT. And he's like, who? I said, I was saluting the officer, you know, that you work for that. And he's, he's like, bro, there was nobody there. Mm. Like, huh? 
but I had seen her. And then later, it was either that day or the next day, I pushed it. I had, uh, I saved his life by pushing him out of the way of an oncoming truck. Only there was no truck there. Yeah. So mostly I just kind of pissed him off by knocking him on his face in the road. <laughs> right. That's not a good choice. No, so I was just wound. Um, I remember, like, even when I came back from Korea, my, my friends were like, stop pacing. Cause I, well, but, and then, it, like, yeah, because, like, like, standing in formation was just horrendous around that time. I couldn't, I felt like I was going to shake apart. Mm. Like, and he said, like, when you're low on this, you stand in formation a lot. Yeah. That's kind of what you do. So as soon as, like, my heels clicked together to be, you know, I'm staying at attention, I was literally shaking. And I thought, I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to die. I'm going to explode. I can't take this. Because you're having to stand so still. Just because I had to stand still. Yeah, I had, um, like, my body was just overwhelmed with that fight or flight, even though there was nothing happening. But there was. Right. There was nothing out here happening. Right. Right. Which just, um, I find it so interesting. So I've shared so many times my dad's story. And my dad was in from Vietnam, every conflict to Desert Storm. And so here's my husband, not really, really in combat. And yet, this is what you suffered under. Yeah, it was it was very stressful. I mean, we'd have inspections from North Koreans. They would allow the North Korean oh, gen geez. generals in. And they would say, no matter what question you're asked, only say your... Like your oh, only of your your name. Wow. How many trucks are in the motor pool? Mark Weir. My name is Specialist Mark Weir. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, and then could you share how you shared today about you know when they when you were flighted up to? Oh my gosh! Yeah. So. Yeah, it's the um. I had gotten to like up to that point in my life, you know, whenever I had any kind of a emotional struggle, I could. I could keep it all shut down inside, right? You know how that goes, a lot of you. You just shove it all inside, kind of have the mask, you're good. I got to that point where I couldn't. Right. It was broken. I was just a raw nerve, which was mm -hmm. not happening. So I went to my sergeant one day, like it was after morning exercise and before first formation, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to die. Somebody's gonna die if I stay in formation again. And so I went to my uh, squad sergeant I told him, I can't remember exactly what I babbled, but I'm like, I, I can't go into formation. I can't. Mm. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> um, and I'm just freaked out and panicked. And so he, he took me over to the base medical clinic, just a little place, which is kind of like the ER. And there's, you know, you, you wait forever to get in, but they must have seen something in my demeanor that tipped him off that there was... There was a problem here, so I was pretty quickly talking to, like, whatever major was in charge and, like, just spilling it to him. Gosh, I don't remember more of it now. Like, he's just, like, listening to me, and he goes, all right, all right. And then he, he calls in, he called in a sergeant, um, the, like, an armed sergeant, and said, stand by him until I get back. Wow. Because you were telling Maribel today, so I don't know if I missed it because I wasn't, you know, it's obviously when you're just listening in your earbuds, you don't catch it all. But there was something where, or maybe you and I were talking, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You were saying they gave you 30 days. Oh, yeah. And then okay. they, because you were, they considered you a danger to others. Yeah, it, yeah. They, um, so yeah, I was in there like telling this, you know, telling this major what was going on. Um, and he went, he left the room to check with somebody else, but in the meantime, he called this sergeant in that has what his weapon drawn and said wow. watch that guy wow um so then the major came back in um we talked for another couple minutes and then very shortly after that within five minutes i mean it was quick they had me on a helicopter and he backed me down to the main military hospital in seoul korea and put me in the psychiatric ward there mm -hmm. So I'm going to fast forward. Um, we're going to do this in a three-part series because it's a long story. And you guys need to hear how he went from that to this amazing. I can't say enough about how amazing you are. Um, even in the 20 years that we've been married, it's just incredible. But I want to fast forward you. So you get out of the, the psych ward and they, they and I shared yesterday, they medicated him to stay up. They medicated him to go to sleep just to regulate sleep cycles, mm -hmm. eating and all that. And 
what I thought was really impactful is when you shared today that why you got your Schmidt together to come back to the States. Like when you finally came, like it wasn't because like, oh, you want to be all healthy and child. It was just like, no, you would be in an institution, right? Yeah, that's right. Because Maribel, Maribel, not knowing all the details of my story and all that, not knowing all of my background, of course, asked like, okay, so she would, I think she might've been visual, visualizing me being in the psychiatric ward and having a realization of, wow, I have been unhealthy and this is, this, you know, maybe this is rock bottom and from here, I... Because some people do hit rock bottom and you're like, oh, that's the turning point. Right. This is not a turning point. It was just, um, I didn't change you necessarily for the better. I just changed because the, the right. thing was the, part of the reason I was there for, for so long, it was at least a month, probably a little more, was the the colonel in charge down there was debating like, okay, do we send you back to your unit or do we discharge you from the military, send you back to, I think it was California, mm. and institutionalize you? Which is so freaking scary that that's, so I worked in Santa Monica, and as you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of the homeless guys are were military vets that they just let out of the VA hospital because there was no more room. Yeah, so there but for the grace of God. Exactly, yeah. You might have met me in Santa Monica under very different conditions. I would give you a dollar. I bet you would your sweet tips, thing. that's right. right. Um, okay, so yeah, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Were you gonna say something? Yeah, so I was, I did not want to get discharged. <laughs> And sent to an institution that sounded really bad. Uh, so basically, the, the the fact that they had medically regulated me enabled me to at least kind of get it together. Yeah. And kind of pack it all in and get it. No, I'm good. I'm good. And, right. Right. Um, it would, but it was close enough that like the the full colonel in charge. If you're not familiar with military rankings, full colonel is is one step under general. He didn't feel like he could make that call. I had to plead my case to a brigadier general. That they wow. Wow. Anyway, yeah, and then they brought in my um, my company commander and company first sergeant. They had to vouch for me. They had to say they were willing to bring me back. Dang. All of that, and then I went back. So did you go back to your unit after that? I forget. Yeah, I went back to my unit then. Okay. Um, and when you're when you're in the army, if you have any kind of a <clears throat> physical condition that makes you unable to perform parts of your job, they give you a profile, basically a slip of paper that says because of this condition, right. you can can't do this. Like if you have a busted ankle, you have a a leg profile. You know, no running for X amount of times. That type of thing. Name you know name the condition and thing. I have a psychiatric profile. It said because of potential danger to. Uh, danger to others, especially if we're not allowed near weapons mm. for 30 days. It's kind of tricky when you're in the army to not be around weapons. Yeah, right. I was like, they're especially in the DMZ, they're they're everywhere. Right. Wow. So I spent a lot of time in my room. So. <laughs> so isolation always good, right? Yeah, real healthy. Yeah. E. And then at the end of 30 days, my commander said. Well, let's just do another 30 days just to be sure. Wow. So. How long were you in Korea? Uh, I was I was there for a year. Okay. And then you came home. And were you in Georgia after that? Mm hmm And then you got out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, let me, I don't even know how long we've been going. We should probably wrap this up, this session. Um, so, from there, and, and I love, like, what Maribel and Mark were talking about. You know, they kind of sped through, like, his whole journey over the last, I was 23 you started getting healthy seven years ago. I'm trying to do that math. You were 45, right? Mm -hmm. So that would take about 22 years from, well, maybe if you were in Korea, what, you were 24? Yeah. So let's say like 20 years it took him to go from that rock bottom point mm -hmm. to starting where you are now or starting yeah. that journey and continuing on. And the reason why Mark and I are on here, because his story is so powerful. And I do emotional releasing and healing with essential oils. That's what I do. This is my wheelhouse. We right. talk about um, trauma release. We talk about healing from depression and anxiety and all that. All using 
well, all, in, in, our, in our family, we eat plants and mm -hmm. we use essential oils to do that. And, yep. and that's how we do. And I, I talk about how it's not the oils that necessarily heal you. We'll talk about that at, like, you know, maybe tomorrow or the next day. Right. Um, but what I love, like, if you look behind Mark, this is our, this is our medicine. This is what we use. And it's not, Mark did not ch swap one med for another. He swapped something that was going to help him make his brain want to do the things and actually get healthier. And how did we say it before we hopped on? It was like, you use these to, what? What do you, you do? Using the oils, you mean? Yeah. It's just using them to, I had the, I had the desire to change it and the body is designed to heal itself. So. Yeah, but you don't use the, like, you don't, you don't, you don't have this danger to yourself. You don't have those struggles anymore, but you still use the oils. Right. So it keeps you like on a, just keep getting better and better and a, and a bigger emotional health. Yeah. Like, like specifically <clears throat> the oil I use the most, um, when I was getting off the medication was Rosa Sharon. So I don't take Rose of Sharon now every day for seven years as if it was a medicine. Right. Like if you miss your Rose of Sharon, you're not going to spiral. Like if you missed, I remember one time I went to California and I think you forgot your meds. Yeah. That was, I was panicked. Yeah, it wasn't good. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, okay. Well, so we'll hop on because we don't, I mean, we could talk for two hours and maybe we will one day. He has this vision that we're going to write a book together and I'm like, you're ridiculous. <laughs> No, I'm not. You're not ridiculous. I think the idea, I'm like, oh my gosh, have you met me? I'm so bossy. Anyway, we're going that's to... Of, that's a good part of my story. Too. Okay, we have to ask, answer this. Rose is asking, funny enough, why Rose of Sharon? Um, before I let you say it, like, I found out some freaking amazing, awesome science on Rose of Sharon. Well, for me, honestly, Jen was diffusing it. I walked through the room I wanted to just crawl inside the diffuser. It smelled so good and I felt so happy. And please know, he, that was unusual for him. Feeling happy was not something that Mark felt. He didn't feel anything unless like before the meds, it was just a dark spiral. And even with the meds, there would be times where you were like, just whatever. Yeah. If you're on, if you're on antidepressants, you know, it's like, uh, Oh, oh, the Bose speaker thing. Share yeah. that. Yeah, it was like I felt like a cheap set of speakers. They didn't have the no low lows, no high highs, nothing, just right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that's such a perfect analogy. Um, and if you guys look up, if you know anything about oils, um, yeah, exactly. Where they dull your brain. Specifically, Rose of Sharon. When I was doing my research on that, there is a constituent in there that can create permanent change. Um, and I thought I was like, this is why that worked. Yeah. Why that helped you and your brain changed because that's what oils do, right? Like, and and then you went on a, a path of healing because even you still took meds even after we went plant based. Mm -hmm. Oh, and P.S. If any of you believers were like, he just needs Jesus. He had Jesus. I did. Mm -hmm. He just was never told that you could permanently heal. And the, the mental illness, the mental health, that, that discussion is taboo. We don't talk about that. And thanks all the Christians that made me feel ashamed for taking, taking meds. What did Trish say that one time, uh, or the other day where she's like, is there a shame away oil? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it's shame away. Because I think some people carry shame and guilt, and it's like there's no shame in it. It is what no. it is. Let's just open up the conversation and, and discuss how you can get better. And that's why Mark, that he will, you know, because I'm me, I'm like, hey, go, go, go tell your story. These guys need to hear your story. I mean, you work at Fenway so that you can talk to these people who are hurting and need so badly mm -hmm. some hope. Yeah, and as far as much as I'm happy and am grateful that I'm not on meds not on meds anymore and never will be again. I will certainly never look down my nose at people who are. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah, that's all hey, you know. Hey, you kept me alive. Yeah. It's that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I remember the day where I said, I, I thought he was bipolar. We never had him diagnosed, but I swear to you, I thought you were bipolar. And I'm like, please go get help because it was dark. It was a dark time in our marriage. That's and yeah, we still had fun, but it was not as much fun as we're having now. 
We have lots of fun now. Yes, we do. Speaking of, we have birthday presents to go by. And that's lots of and fun too. We should let these people go. So we'll see you tomorrow. He'll be back um, to share more of his journey because uh, there's really so much more from from Korea to when we went plant based and when you started using oils and, and even all the running you do now and. Ladies, he's probably going to preach at you about how you should be running, too. Mm -hmm. I'm up to running five miles a day because of this man. So You're awesome. No, you're awesome. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys, for watching. We'll talk soon.